Hi, it's me, Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut. <clears throat> Clearly that's the first time I've spoken this morning because it's again another morning of trying to see uh, SpaceX launch the GPS-3 satellite, the first GPS-3 satellite. You guys may have seen this before because we've done this a few times. This is, how many times is this rocket scrubbed? Are we at four or five? Um, two were due to uh, some kind of out of like sensor reading uh, and then lots of weather delays, lots and lots and lots of weather delays. So you're going to get pretty familiar with this site. Again, this is of course, everydayastronaut.com. Go to pre-launch previews. You'll get exactly this rundown, this preview of, of any upcoming launch or most upcoming launches at least. Uh, we, we don't always write up articles on all of them, but most of the big ones, especially the ones that I'll be live streaming, uh, we do write up a, uh, a little pre-launch preview. So this is <laughs> SpaceX launching the GPS satellite uh, today, December 3rd. Uh, hopefully at 8.51 a.m. local time. So, <laughs> uh, and of course, uh, of course, this is uh, the GPS-3 SV-01. So it's the first, uh, the very first third generation satellite. That's such a weird sentence. First third generation satellite. Yeah, there we go. Launch provider. This is SpaceX launching this. The customer is the United States Air Force. The rocket is their Falcon 9, which is their workhorse rocket. Uh, this is a Block 5 version, though, so that means it's their newest iteration of that Falcon 9 vehicle. It's The serial number is 1054.1. Notice the dot one means it's the first and only time this rocket's going to fly. Uh, we'll talk more about why it's the only time it's going to fly in a second here. The launch location is, is Space Launch Complex uh, 40 at Cape Canaveral Air Force Station, and of course... Uh, remember, if it has the word space in front of Launch Complex, that means it's at the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. If it just says Launch Complex, like LC-39, that's actually at Kennedy Space Center. And although those two are literally, like, touching and on the same island, basically, I mean, they're literally, boop, right there. Uh, one, one is technically Cape Canaveral Air Force Station, and slightly to the south, and north of that is Kennedy Space Center. So there's only really two pads that are... Uh, really active-ish right now, and that's LC-39 and 39A and B. Uh, but yeah, any almost all of the launches are technically out of Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. Uh, the payload mass is about 3,800 kilograms, 3,900 kilograms, 8,500 pounds. Uh, it's going out to medium Earth orbit, which is where GPS satellites are. That means it goes around the Earth exactly twice a day. Um, this uh, They will not be attempting to recover this booster. Boo. <laughs> uh, it's just a little sad. It's just, especially sad to see a brand new rocket out there that's completely butt naked. No grid fins, no landing legs. It looks super weird. Yeah. And by the way, we're, we're I realized yesterday we were almost exactly at the one year anniversary of them landing a rocket. Or not the one year, the three year anniversary to the day almost of them landing a rocket. And now, um, here we are three years later, we're like, I can't believe this one doesn't have landing legs. It looks so weird. It's so weird to have an expendable vehicle. Uh, so it will crash into the ocean. <laughs> There's no attempted recovery of the fairing. And these fairings also have a little additional um, uh, ablative material at the very tip of the fairing. But this thing must just be screaming. Uh, they must be getting a little extra juice out of this beast because <laughs> no landing legs. So it's, it's light, it's lean, it's mean, and it's got... It's gonna just punch through that atmosphere. So this is the 66th flight of a Falcon 9 rocket. Uh, this will be the 21st mission for SpaceX in, in 2018. That is breaking the record by two. So they already have the most, last year they launched 19, this year they've already done 20. So if this goes, it's 21. Notice that I'm having to be in the habit of saying, if this goes, because this thing has delayed so many times. Uh, so yeah, so this is, this is of course a, a beautiful graphic from Jeff Barrett. Woo, yeah. Yes, we have been here before, people. This is number, what, four or five. Um, so let's, first off, thank you, Johan. Greetings from Denmark. And and Amy for being a new member. Thank you. And Johan, again, you talked to Elon on Twitter. We'll talk about that right now. Uh, Morgan, uh, hi, Tim. Just wondering, how does government shutdown affect NASA and SpaceX launches and missions, given that SpaceX needs FAA and NASA to launch our most ongoing NASA missions on hold? So the way I understand it, and I'm, because we've had this a few times already, but for the most part, um, there's already budgets in place to operate a lot of this stuff. So even like NASA has a working budget already. Um, 
but at this point, you know, like at some point that does run out, <laughs> but the government shutdown basically is, uh, I don't know. It's confusing stuff, guys. I don't know. But really, um, I know, for instance, there was a, a bill to extend uh, military support so we don't just lose military when the government shuts down. Otherwise, <laughs> government shut down and then all of a sudden, boom, war and we're gone. Uh, I think that's, uh, and obviously the military supports these launches, specifically this launch is not only supported by the 45th Space Wing the, out at uh, Cape Canaveral Air Force Station, but also this is a, a GPS launch for the Air Force. So, um, and Renau, good morning, Tim. Hope to see this rocket launch. I do too. Please, please. Oh, uh, thank you. Um, so let's start off. We got a lot to talk about because look at what happened yesterday. Yesterday, there was... A conversation about Tesla on Twitter. Let me make this, let me embiggify this. Also, I think I may have realized why, uh, why exactly uh, there are so many scrubs. It's because I wasn't drinking out of this SpaceX mug that is borderline offensively huge. So that's probably why uh, I haven't been using it for any of these launches. So just remember that. So there was um, some conversation yesterday about Tesla. Then out of nowhere, Chris Robo be Robot Beat uh, says, you got something to show us in Texas? And it's some pictures of uh, what some of us have been already speculating to be. Yeah, <laughs> there was some conversation about it being either a water water tower or some people thought it was going to be a hopper. Uh, a hopper for the BFR, the rocket formerly known as BFR slash Starship slash Super Heavy. Uh, so, so this is... Uh, a mock-up of a mock-up slash it'll be the hopping test vehicle of Starship Super Heavy. So someone asked me, "Wait, what?" Everyday astronaut. And I said, "Stainless steel balloon tanks, heavy metal." Calling it now. Welcome. I actually said, "Welcome Atlas back," but welcome back Atlas B, which was uh, the first intercontinental ballistic missile. To it was the first one with a sustainer engine that dropped and and could actually put payloads into orbit. It used stainless steel balloon tanks, which are I'll talk about. I'll, I'll be doing a video about it today. Um, and then, then Elon comes around and corrects me. Stainless steel is correct, but different mixture of alloys and new architecture. Unlike Atlas, Starship is buckling stable on launch pad, even when unpressurized. And this led to, um, a fantastic, uh, while there are some material similarities, Starship is very different from the Atlas design. I, it definitely is different because first of all, <laughs> you know, we're talking about a, well, so here's, here's why I said buckling is it's stable from buckling, um, when unpressurized. This is what happened when a stainless steel fuselage on an Atlas rocket, uh, when it lost pressure, it just absolutely folds over. And believe it or not, this payload survived. <laughs> so I said, here's a direct video for those too lazy to click on Chris B from NASA Space Flight. He said, for those wondering what a vehicle that requires pressurization for structural integrity looks like when that goes wrong. And I go, here's a direct video for those too lazy to click. This is why, unlike Atlas, Starship is buckling stable. Guys, I had a... I had a bit of a day yesterday when unpressurized is a key element. And so Elon said, yep, actually the only significant or the only significant design element in common with the early Atlas is stainless steel. And we're using a different alloy mix. I love 300 series stainless. We're getting some hard facts on this stuff. This is good. I can maybe finally actually make a video about this because now we have some information to go off of instead of just pure speculation. <laughs> okay. So. He says, I will do a full technical presentation of Starship after the test vehicle we're building in Texas Fly. So hopefully March or April for this test vehicle. Wait, says John Krause. Wait, March or April 2019? This is so much sooner than expected. Yes? And he said, yes. Awesome. Uh, what sped up the pace? I don't think Elon was in that thread anymore. <laughs> so then I said, uh, what's the big breakthrough? Structurally sound when unpressurized, but lightweight. And then... Lucas says, will this structure hold the SSTO ability? Ha ha! Ha 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 ha! Remember how I've made videos about how SSTOs suck? Yes, but single booster, single stage to orbit with no payload is pointless. <laughs> Add super heavy rocket booster and orbital payload is gigantic. Only need booster on Earth due to deep gravity well and thick atmosphere. Starship alone on moons and on moons and Mars. Like I always say, folks, SSTOs suck, as heavily touched on in this video. Not to mention going up SSTO is one thing, reusing is another. That's that's the whole thing with SSTOs. If you're the point of an SSTO would be to, to be able to reuse it. Why have to bring like the margins already so thin to get something up into space? So your margins to bring something back down and survive re-entry, and now you have to 
you know, have your entire vehicle coated in thermal protection system and add all these things to make it survive re-entry just so you can have a single stage. It doesn't make sense. I've said that for a long time. And Elon goes, seriously, we're just on the wrong planet for SSTOs. Mars, no problem. So that's why I said maybe SSTOs don't suck. Maybe Earth sucks. And uh, then Elon, let's see. So this is kind of a mock-up here. Um, there's something beyond that. I even had uh, something a little bit beyond that. Let me... Let me show you guys uh, something that someone had sent to me. It is this. Do, 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 do. Boom, look at this. So these are all pieces that are out there at Boca Chica, Texas. So this is their upcoming launch site. Yeah, it's coming together, guys. This is legit. <laughs> I can't believe we're looking at this right now. This is so nine meters wide. This is life-size width. He did say it's not full height. This is crazy stuff, guys. We are finally seeing some some cool stuff happen. I am super thrilled. So there we go. We have some information <laughs> and some confirmation. Stainless steel. Stainless steel, stainless steel. That's the heavy metal. Uh, I'll be talking about why stainless steel makes sense. Uh, I'm going to work on it today. Hopefully, I'll get it out today or tomorrow. Um, I've got a lot of research I've been doing. I, I've been chasing this down for a few weeks trying to kind of get an idea of why stainless steel would, would be more beneficial or advantageous to composites, to carbon fiber. And quite frankly, guys, this is Rocketry 101. Rocket science is a compromise. That's going to be like the main overarching theme of the video that I produce is that rockets are a compromise, big time. Uh, there's no right anything. It's like there's trade-offs for absolutely every decision in a rocket. And that's the fun part about, just like if you've ever played Kerbal Space Program, which I hope you have, you know how it goes. You're trying to choose between a Poodle and a Nerva, and sometimes you realize, wait, the Poodle actually gives me more Delta V for less weight because it's lighter or whatever. You know, like you might realize yada, 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 there are advantages to almost everything. So yeah, so that's some exciting news from yesterday. Okay, sorry, I just had to get this out here because I'm really really excited about this this is really cool to see some so and by the way what this will probably be this is basically going to be just like the grasshopper or the f9r dev vehicle that they used to have at their mcgregor uh test site in in texas as well texas obviously gets all the cool fun we're gonna play with hardware stuff um and so yeah they this will just basically have most likely a single raptor engine and they'll be working on uh hovering and and maneuvering and throttling with the Raptor, you know, precisely controlling a Raptor engine, just like they did with the Merlin engine. They just have to scale it up. This is going to have similar size and weight to uh, the Starship. So, yeah, there you go. Um, I'm super, super stoked. So, uh, let's see. Let me answer a few of you guys' questions. Good morning, Tim. Hope to see this rocket launch. Oh, yeah, from Renau. Thank you. And I hope so, too. I think I already said that, but thank you. Uh, Bastion, greetings from Netherlands. Well, hello. Thank you. Uh, Peter, some of, ongoing, some, of, some of ongoing NASA missions rely on contractors that already have been paid. So in the event of a shutdown, there is no direct effects on them. That is very true. Uh, thank you for that, Peter. Um, and Counter Tony. I don't want no scrubs. The scrubs launched. I can't get no Delta V. <laughs> With apologies to TLC. I started to make a video once for like, we don't want no scrubs, and I gave up on it. But that's funny that you said that. <laughs> uh, say strix. Hey, Tim. I'm in Miami, and I'm walking out on the beach right now to see my first rocket launch in real life. Even if it's just a streak moving up to the sky. I hope that's the case. You should see. It looks like it's a beautiful day. You'll see a bright light. Um, you'll see the contrail when it gets into that portion of the atmosphere where the ice crystallizes and all that stuff. It should be awesome. I really hope it's a beautiful day out there. Uh, I can't wait. Hopefully this thing goes today. Um, yeah. <laughs> Z Family Home. Do Falcon 9 second stage typically become space junk or re-enter and burn up? They do want... They always... So most missions, almost all missions, this one's probably going to be one that cannot. But almost all missions... Uh, they purposefully deorbit them, especially when you're when you're doing a uh, a geostationary transfer orbit. You can quickly turn the stage around and and easily lower your lowest point, your periapsis. And they normally have a place where they ditch the oceans in the Indian Ocean, so or ditch the <laughs> ditch the stages in the Indian Ocean, and uh, that's a controlled reentry. You know, they they 
have an exclusion zone there so the stage you know if there's any remnants of stages or engines uh, it doesn't fall into a, a ship or traffic, so they even have an exclusion zone there for the re-entry burn-up. But, um, yeah, that being said, they also have, say you're doing something like like today, I don't know, I would honestly guess that, so they have graveyard orbits is another thing. So say it deploys, so today the second stage will actually not be in an elliptical orbit. It's going all the way out to its permanent orbit, which is like, I don't remember what medium Earth orbit is like, like, 12,000 kilometers or something like that pretty pretty far out there and at that point it would take quite a bit of energy to deorbit again um oh this is going live people yes come on baby um by the way has everyone else i watched some other stuff youtube's live streams lately have been super compressed like really compressed that means like if you see non-moving like non-moving things stationary pixels look nice and sharp moving pixels group together in these big blocks of compression and i had never seen that hardly at all before about a week ago and all of a sudden like all live streams i've been watching have the same gross amount of compression so um if you guys get on twitter or something ask what's up with compression it's not on my end i've watched other streams from other devices from other places uh, we're sitting here on a nice clean pipe, so I'm giving you guys the best that I can do, uh, so just bear with me. Um, weird. Yeah, it is, it is very strange. I don't know quite what is up with um, with the compression. So, yeah, so I don't even remember what we were talking about a second ago. Uh, oh, yeah, graveyard orbits and stuff like that. So, I don't know when, when this stage, since it actually has to take the payload all the way out to its final destination... I don't know what happens with this particular stage. Sometimes it's easier just to jet it into a, a like a orbit that's junk, and so that is a graveyard orbit. Or um, if they'll try to, if they have the ability to deorbit, I don't know. Um, <laughs> you're a compressed goofy boy. That's what I've always wanted to be in life. Just a compressed goofy boy. Oh, I'm gonna stick this up here because uh, they're hopefully gonna. Let's see how how much time do we have? Oh yeah, I have my timer. Um, guys, joke's on me, didn't have my timer up for you. Now you know. Um, wait, is it really? They must have pushed back a little bit. Let's check Twitter. <laughs> See if they said anything. So, most recent tweets are that all systems and weather are go for today's launch. That was 51 minutes ago. 8.51. Um, so yeah, that's 13 minute. Yeah, I'm surprised they don't have their webcast up yet. Maybe they're just sick of, they're probably like me and just sad that they're having to do this again. Tom Perdario is probably like, no. And Shiva's probably like, don't make me say it all again. Is this the third time they've actually had the live stream totally up? I know for sure too. Yeah, I, this is at least the third time. Is that the third or the fourth? We'll have to see. Uh, Barry, thanks for rekindling my passion for all things space. Thank you, Barry. Yeah, uh, I'm with you, man. Like, my passion for space has just gone through the roof lately. Uh, I mean, I, I'm like you guys. I grew, I, maybe I'm not like you guys, but like for me, actually, I wasn't a huge space flight fan when I was young. Uh, I liked the space shuttle. I had like space shuttle bed sheets at one point and like three le space shuttle Lego sets. But I didn't love it. My big, I loved music and cars and like the Harrier jump jet. And that's, that's about it. You know, like those were my things. I didn't really pay that much attention to space flight. And for me, it's just been the past five years that I've like gone from like to just like exponential curve of absolute nerdgasm. Like I just am obsessed with space flight stuff now. Um, so yeah, I, I'm glad that all of us are getting excited together because I think it is really actually an exciting time. I think we're coming upon a new golden era of space flight where things are changing and happening at a pace that we haven't seen in, since the 60s. Um, and people are excited. People want this stuff to happen and it's awesome. It is super, super, super cool. So thank you, Barry. Uh, Chessburger, music is up. Boom, we got it rolling. Thank you. Um, Peter, I hope everything is normal. <laughs> normal as we sit here. Um, Zane Raza, do you know what cameras they use on the rockets? I kind of do. Um, they, so, okay. Um, they're basically their own, like, virtually in-house cameras, believe it or not. And 
Um, at, at one point, they have, like, they've apparently, apparently strapped a GoPro onto a, um, like, according to their release, was actually a GoPro when they had a fairing drop test once. Um, and, or not a drop test, but they actually released footage from a GoPro inside a fairing. That's not their normal camera. Um, that may have just been something for that. You know, I don't know. Um, but the normal cameras they use on the vehicle are not GoPros. They are their own in-house design. Um, yeah. Um, keep those upper level winds under control. Yes, Space Kyle. Our fingers are crossed today. We So remember, I, I want to remind people, I have this had, had this question a few times. Is like, if SpaceX plans to try to use um, a vehicle to do any kind of like, you know, earth to earth transportation or anything. How on earth can we rely on a rocket if we've seen it scrub? Like you can't, if, if your flight, if you're relying on a rocket to, you know, fly to Dubai or something, uh, you can't have it delay a week. A week delay is not a good thing. Um, there are a few things though that can help. Um, number one is as we increase in flight, we'll have uh, a more reliable vehicle. So remember there was an out of family sensor. At some point, if this really is a human transportation service, there would be contingencies for that. There'd be backup boosters. There'd be backup spaceships. There'd be all these things um, that hopefully you wouldn't just be like, yeah, sorry, uh, rockets. We have a faulty sensor in one of the engines. Now our flight's canceled. <laughs> like, you know, uh, I'm sure there'd be contingencies there. But the other big thing is the Falcon 9 in particular is more susceptible to bad weather than other vehicles. Um, it's, uh, we talked about this the other day. It's technically, by definition, the finest rocket. Um, let me do one of these guys. Um, you can see my the models back here. Uh, of course, these are Buzz Space models. Probably a link in the description. If there's not, my website, I have uh, a tab that says Partners, and you can find the link to Buzz Space models. But yeah, here is a Falcon 9 rocket. Uh, it is, by definition, the finest rocket currently flying, and maybe ever even. Uh, that The finest ratio is how wide compared to how tall, so that ratio of width to, to overall length. And because it's so long and skinny, uh, it is more prone to <coughs> being snapped in half like a pencil than uh, a more stout and beefy vehicle. So um, that be so, I'm, guys. By the way, I'm guessing. Oh, my timer is gone again. Get that timer back. Timer back. I'm guessing they pushed back a little bit in the clock and they just haven't told us yet. Um, because yeah, at this point we're like seven minutes away from its supposed launch. But yeah, so that being said, because it's so fine, because it's so skinny uh, and, and tall, it is more prone to weather delays than other vehicles. Um, that's one of the things that I think BFR slash the rocket formerly known as BFR Starship Super Heavy. Um, I do think that will be less susceptible because it is uh, not nearly as wide as it is tall, basically. That, that ratio is a lot, a lot better in that behalf. Um, we finally have a web stream going. This is good news. Now we're going to see if there's more than six minutes on the clock or, uh, or where we're at. So I can't wait. Please, please take off today. Let's do 21 for the year. But at the same time, we want to Good see. morning from SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California. It's Sunday, December 23rd, and you're looking at a live view of the Falcon 9 rocket as it awaits its 8.51 a.m. Eastern Standard Time launch from Cape Canaveral Air Force Station in Florida. Today's launch is of the GPS-3 Space Vehicle 1 satellite for the United States Air Force. My name is Michael Andrews, and I'm a part of the supply chain team here at SpaceX. For those of you just joining us, we had launch attempts Tuesday and Saturday mornings. Yesterday's launch was scrubbed due to some strong upper winds, but we have good news. Weather's looking good right now, and we're clear to proceed with today's launch attempt. Today, we're launching a satellite for the Global Positioning System, commonly known as GPS. Now you've likely heard of GPS satellites, which provide a diverse range of positioning and timing services around the world for both civil and military purposes. Today is the first launch of the latest generation of GPS, known as GPS-3, which will introduce new capabilities such as improved accuracy, improved anti-jamming capabilities, and an extended service life per space vehicle. We have four more GPS-3 missions contracted with the U.S. Air Force upcoming in the future. This morning, we'll be launching the GPS-3 satellite into a highly elliptical transfer orbit, with the ultimate destination being medium Earth orbit, or MEO. Now, due to a combination of satellite mass and the MEO orbit, we will not be attempting to recover today's first stage, as we need to reserve enough propellant to get the payload to its intended orbit. 
My name is Shiva. I'm a Falcon integration and test engineer here at SpaceX. I love that black tip with a little bit of extra ablative coating on top of that fairing. Now, we're about T minus four and a half minutes to the launch. Weather remains positive, and we're tracking no constraints to the launch. You'll notice the transporter erector, that large truss structure next to the rocket, will be retracting away from Falcon 9 to provide a clearance for the Falcon 9's liftoff. Now, we're also currently finishing propellant load on the rocket. Falcon 9 uses a refined form of kerosene called RP-1 for its fuel and super chilled, <coughs> excuse me, super chilled liquid oxygen, or LOX, as its oxidizer. Now, RP-1 is currently fully loaded on both the first and second stages. Liquid oxygen is fully loaded on the first stage and nearly fully loaded on the second stage. And we'll be closing that out at T minus three minutes and T minus two minutes, respectively. So with Falcon 9 now moving into the final stages of terminal count, vehicle remains in good health. About 60 seconds before liftoff, you'll hear final announcement that Falcon 9 is in startup. That'll mean that the rocket has switched to its internal flight computers and, will be, and they will be autonomously controlling the launch countdown. So with just about three and a half minutes to go before launch, let's pause here and listen to terminal count. I just wanted to point out that the <laughs> on that last shot, it's, it's taken from one of these lightning rods here that are around the launch pad to make sure that if lightning were to strike the area, that is more <laughs> uh, more attractive to lightning than the rocket itself. Um, but there's cameras on there, and you can see a camera uh, from, of the fairing with the black tip on it, and you can see birds flying below it, like flocks of birds just soaring through the air, and it makes you remember that, yes, this thing is 70 meters tall, 220 load, feet tall. It is huge. And, of course, friendly reminder again um, about that it's not smoking. That's not smoke you're seeing on the vehicle. That is actually condensation. So uh, if you were to go up and touch this vehicle right now, it would be so cold your hand would freeze to it because it's uh, there's liquid oxygen in there that's minus, I believe, uh, SpaceX chills there, I think... Off the top of my head, minus 207 degrees Celsius is how cold they chill their, their liquid oxygen. They get it down to almost a solid. Um, that's how much they, com they, they make it cold. It's really dense. And uh, when that cold surface comes in contact with the, uh, the humidity in the air, it condenses just like, you know, when you open a freezer um, or if you are outside and you open like a, something really cold, you see the condensation pour out. Um, you know, we've probably all seen that, or dry ice, you see that same phenomenon. Uh, that's exactly all we're seeing right now. So, stage two locks load. But you can up. also see certain areas are purging. That's where valves open up. Uh, as the gas. Falcon uh, is on internal power. Good. Uh, as the liquid oxygen warms up, it does expand when it turns into a gas, and they vent that out. And it's still really cold, so it comes in contact with the air. And that condenses, and then you see these extra, like, perfect little purge clouds popping out of the vehicle. Like there, on the back of the transporter vector. That's because they have topped off, so anything left in the lines there are purging. Um, and this transporter vector, don't forget, will we'll, uh, slide all the way back, uh, right at T minus zero, to all the way back to, like, 45 degrees very, very quickly. It does that so it gets out of the way, so all the lines, all the connections, the umbilicals, um, they don't have to do nearly as much refurbishment on the vehicle if it's out of the way from the exhaust plume, from the, from the rocket exhaust. Um, and I'll be getting to your guys' things here in a second. Thank you, guys. Um, but, yeah, we're at T-minus one minute here. Falcon 9 is in startup. Here we go. This is the day I can just tell. We got so used to no scrubs that we forgot what it's like. <laughs> All my poor friends out there that are rocket photographers and, and in the media... This is the mission director. Go for launch. Yes. Yes, please. <laughs> but yeah, my poor friends in the media having to go out to the Cape, it gets very, very, very exhausting when you're like driving in there. All It like, takes 45 minutes to get there from wherever you're at on the Cape, basically. And just driving yes, back and forth and back and forth and setting up cameras and taking them down and setting them up and taking them down, changing batteries. So this one's for you guys. All right, 15 seconds. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Ignition. Yes. Yes. 
Yes! I don't have to wake up super early tomorrow morning. Go, baby, go. Now, this is a vital mission. This is a U.S. Air Force contract. This is a GPS satellite. The first of a third generation half billion dollar satellite. So we, this is mission critical. This is a big mission for SpaceX. Good one to close out the year. A huge year, a year with Falcon Heavy, a year with Block 5, a year with the th first thrice flown rocket. This is a big year. This is a big, big year for SpaceX. And here we go. We've had a successful liftoff of the Falcon 9 vehicle carrying the GPS-3 space vehicle into transfer orbit. We're a little bit less than a, than a minute into our launch and we're preparing for that point of maximum aerodynamic pressure known as maximum Q. That maximum aerodynamic pressure, that'd be a good name for an album. Vehicle is supersonic. And we've hit our point of maximum Q. This is the st these are the strongest loads the vehicle experiences during liftoff. At this point now, it's just an easy acceleration up into our desired transfer orbit. All is looking good with the stage, the stage one trajectory. experiencing maximum aerodynamic pressure. Now we'll have a very busy next 90 seconds. We have three events coming up, main engine cutoff, stage separation, and second engine start number one. That first event, main engine cutoff, or MECO, is where all of the nine Merlin 1D engines you see roaring right now on the screen on our Falcon 9 first stage are going to shut down. This is then followed by stage separation, or the separation of our first and second stages. And finally, the second engine start, where our MVAC, our Merlin vacuum engine, engine chill. on the second stage engine lights up. And you just heard now, we're starting to pump cold liquid oxygen through the plumbing of the MVAC engine to prepare it for ignition, just like we did with the Merlin 1D engines before liftoff. And just a reminder, we're not going to be recovering that first stage. So after stage separation, we'll, we, we'll be providing no views of that first stage, only the second stage and the payload. So this should burn longer. Sometimes they get like two minutes and 40 seconds out of the first stage, two minutes and 38, two minutes, 40 seconds. So I'm guessing since they're getting the full beans out of the first stage, we'll see it burn for more than two minutes and 40 Three seconds. are gonna occur in the next 10 seconds. Look at that. Miko. 249. Clean stage, stage set. Stage separation confirmed. <laughs> Not too many people there at the floor. All That's right, funny. this is great. We've had a successful Miko stage separation <laughs> and SES-1. Our next immediate milestone is the hey, fairing hey, deployment. Hey. We're going to expose the GPS-3 satellite to the vacuum of space. At, at plus three minutes and 21 seconds. There we go. This is obviously important. <laughs> fairing separation confirmed. Oh my god. And there you see the two fairing halves have separated and fallen away from the vehicle, exposing the GPS satellite to space. You he can said, also see one of the fairing halves geez. falling to, into, back into the atmosphere in the camera view right there. He said three Everything minutes and 21 seconds. Everything is running seconds. nominally from the second stage to our payload. <laughs> Don't say that and then have it wait 10 seconds. Signal Bermuda. If that fairing was stuck on, that would be a very bad day for SpaceX and the U.S. Air Force. And you can see on your screen, the MVAC is continuing to burn, raising the highest point of the second stage's orbit, which is also called its apoapsis into that intended target orbit. Now we're currently in the first of two planned MVAC burns with our next major milestone being called C second engine cutoff number one or SECO one. And that's scheduled for T plus eight hour, or excuse me, eight minutes and 16 seconds. Now during SECO one, we'll shut down the second stage's MVAC engine, which uh, you can see again on your screen here. This is a long mission here, folks. <laughs> now, after we shut down the second stage engine, we'll enter into the first of two planned coast phases. Stage stage two is following a nominal trajectory. 
Now, we mentioned this a little bit earlier in the webcast, but we're deploying today's GPS-3 space vehicle into a highly elliptical transfer orbit um, with a target, in final intended target for the spacecraft being medium Earth orbit, or MEO. Now, for those of you who have followed our webcast, you may be more familiar with the terms low Earth orbit, where the International Space Station is, and geostationary orbit, where many communication satellites reside in space. Medium Earth orbit is nestled between these two at an altitude of around 20,200 kilometers, or about 10,900 nautical miles above the Earth. Oh yeah, miles, whoops. Good thing I don't Once the GPS-3 space vehicle separates from the second stage, it will use its own onboard engines to raise the lowest and highest points of its orbit to approximately the same altitude in that MEO range that maneuver is referred to as circularizing its orbit. Now, a, a fun fact here, GPS satellites are tilted with respect to the Earth's equator by about 55 degrees, and that allows them to, to provide coverage to the Earth's polar regions. That uh, orbital tilt is referred to as an orbit's inclination, and it takes extra power from the launch vehicle to safely reach. Uh, that high inclination orbit combined with the large payload mass are actually why we needed to reserve all of Falcon 9's performance today for the primary mission and why we did not attempt to recover today's first stage. Now we're just under two minutes away from Seco 1, again that second engine cutoff number one. MVAC engine is still burning bright, burning that RP1 and liquid oxygen and we're continuing to boost the GPS-3 space vehicle into that highly elliptical transfer orbit. Now this is, this is one of those missions where uh, the Falcon 9, the upper stage of the Falcon 9 is not very efficient. Now you um, may see the status bar at the bottom of the screen. You might be wondering, why does we have two coast phases for this flight as opposed to the typical one? And why does it take us so long to deploy the satellite for this particular mission? It's really twofold. Uh, first, this helps us get the vehicle back within the Air Force's ground station coverage. And also the Falcon 9 is very busy during this, this period. Uh, during the second coast phase, we make sure the second stage is completely shut down. Uh, the MVAC engine gets purged of that RP-1 propellant and gases, which helps us avoid contamination okay. with the satellite. Uh, also, we begin to spin that second stage to help us stabilize the payload for when it's deployed. Once this coast period ends and the Air Force ground station coverage is regained, we're finally ready to deploy that space vehicle. And the MVAC is still firing, and we have just about under 30 seconds to go before that Seco 1 milestone. Concave 8, Earth confirmed. AFTSA. Automatic flight termination system is safe, is what the AFTS safed was. Seco. Okay. We just heard good. the call outs on the net of confirmation of Seco number one. Now we're just going to await confirmation of a good orbital insertion from the launch team. Loss of signal expected, Cape. Nominal orbital insertion. And there's that call out for a confirmation good. of nominal orbital insertion. Now we're going to head into the first of two planned coast phases as the Falcon 9 second stage makes its way to the next uh, engine start window. And during each of these coast phases, we'll take a quick break from our commentary, but you'll be able to follow the second stage's progress on the live tracking animation. Uh, we'll be back in about 57 minutes to relight the second stage's engine during second engine start number two, or SES2, which is scheduled for T plus one hour, eight minutes, and 52 seconds. Now, the second burn is much shorter than the first. It's actually less than a minute. And after that burn completes, we'll shut down the MVAC engine a second time during second engine cutoff number two, or SECO2, before we head into a second coast phase that will last about 49 minutes. Now, after that, we are going to deploy the GPS-3 space vehicle once we're back in that Air Force ground station coverage that you talked about, Mike. Hey, so let's head into that first coast phase. Uh, we'll see you back here live in just under 57 minutes. Bye, Don't ice. go too far. Do you guys see that ice chunk floating off the uh, the second stage there? That is the purge. Let me turn this down ever so slightly. Uh, yeah, you'll see uh, solid chunks of of oxygen purging. Um, yeah, that's and pretty normal to see. You can see it building up there actually, right there on the on the purge valve. 
Uh, pretty cool. Pretty crazy. So nothing nothing out of the ordinary there. So this is going to be a long coast phase. So here's what we're going to do, guys. Uh, we have a long ways to go. So I have a lot of questions to answer. Um, I'm probably only going to live stream to the first, uh, the second engine start off uh, number one. Because then another like 50 minute cutoff. I have a video to produce. I'd rather get this video out for you guys that explains all the fun stuff we learned yesterday about um, the rocket formerly known as BFR Starship Super Heavy. I would rather get that going for those like 50 minutes of coasting than to uh, to sit here and yab at you unconditionally with no facts. <laughs> uh, so first off, uh, I, I was saying for a second there, don't forget the, the the Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy upper stage is very inefficient compared to other uh, upper stages. It's, all, it's like 30% less fuel efficient in a sense. Um, not necessarily fuel efficient, but it's specific impulse, um, which is kind of like your fuel efficiency in space, really. Um, and, that, and that's because it uses uh, RP-1. It is a it uses the same fuel and oxidizer on the upper stage as it uses on the first stage. On the first stage, so again, I, I was talking about this at the beginning of the stream, but really, you know, rockets are always a compromise. And this is a compromise in the fact that it's really easy. They only need one set of uh, infrastructure for both the upper and the first stage and the second stage. Um, it performs most of the missions it needs to. You know, yes, of course, you could make it more capable if you had a cryogenic, you know, hydrogen, a Hydrolox upper stage like a Centaur or like the new Glenn will have. Of course, you can always make, you could always make a more efficient, better rocket, but at what trade-off? Is it going to be more expensive? Is it going to be, you know, harder to do this X, Y, and Z? And apparently, you know, you know, at as this vehicle was devel developed, they realized, like, look, even with just a Carolox upper stage, we can fulfill our mission needs. And, you know, lots of times a, a company starts with, like, here's the kind of payloads and satellites we want to launch. What is the cheapest, easiest, most direct way to get there? And so SpaceX is stuck with a Carolox upper stage, um, which is which is fine. It does its job. But that being said, say in Atlas V on a, on a mission similar to this where you have a coast phase, you, you do a lot of the work with the upper stage. The Centaur upper stage has a lot more Delta V capability than a Merlin engine. It also is significantly less thrust than a Merlin engine. The Merlin engine on the upper stage is crazy powerful. Uh, the Centaur upper stage is very underpowered in a sense, but at the same time, very, very, very efficient. So again, always a trade-off. Always, always, always a trade-off. So, all right, let's get to some of your guys' comments. Um, so, Peter, has has SpaceX ever... Um, or wait, whoa, I'm a little ways back. Okay, sorry. Uh, uh, Zane, let's see. You have to talk about that. Johan, you should work at SpaceX as a live stream manager. No, I shouldn't. I'm not organized enough, and I know who does it, and they do a much better job than I would ever do. <laughs> Uh, but thank you. Um, Charles, great show. Thank you, Charles. Uh, Yannick, Merry Christmas from Germany. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, the only thing I remember, I learned my great-grandpa used to sing uh, O Tannenbaum to me, which I believe is O Christmas Tree in German. That's the closest thing to Merry Christmas that I know how to say <laughs> in German. <laughs> so, uh, Dankeschön. Uh, Josh, suborbital continent to continent spaceships will be more like airplanes, similar to what Virgin are testing, and therefore will be less susceptible to weather. Um, well, Josh, yes. Well, first, thank you. But in a sense, don't forget those SpaceX isn't planning any kind of, um, airplane, you know, aero, like they won't be doing an air launch system. They, th their continent to continent spaceship is their Starship slash Super Heavy, which is a traditional launch vehicle. It takes off from the ground, using a booster. Um, I don't know of any, actually, like, transcontinental, supersonic, rocket propulsive uh, ideas out there that are that are actually air-launched or air, airplane-like. As far as I know, SpaceX is the only company, to so say, like, Virgin Galactic right now, if you were to try to do some kind of, like, transcontinental hop on their Spaceship 2, um, unfortunately... The Delta V it has would not hardly get you from one state to another. You know, like, it's, it only has enough Delta V to go up and straight back down. Even if we were to extend that glide range as far as possible, it would probably be quicker just to stay in a normal jet. Like, so far, I haven't seen anything that is an air launcher that is some kind of uh, transcontinental 
beast. You can see the second stage doing a little roll maneuver here. This is fun. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Give us that roll. Roger roll. Um, so Peter, SpaceX ever, SpaceX ever discussed mission aboards post-launch pre-booster separation, potentially allowing a landing with payload. Uh, and I'd really, 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 really doubt that would be even remotely possible. Um, for a few reasons, um, launch pre-booster separation, potentially, no, I, I just, so, one of the things about, um, man, I, so, okay, so one of the things about the whole landing sequence, it is pre-programmed, like, the, the landing sequence is basically after stage separation, the booster needs to go through a pretty, like, it has parameters, you know what I mean, it's not like, the rocket isn't completely autonomously, like, I don't know. It's hard to explain, but there's certain parameters that knows at some point that, oh, I have to turn and do this, and here's my new target. I'll target that, and then it changes targets after, like, the boost back burn, and then it, it after the re-entry burn, it changes targets again. It, it, it knows these steps, but it still has to go through these certain phases. It's it's not like there's someone, you know, it's not an AI system that knows, like, oh, no, I had something off nominal. The stage didn't deploy. Let me try to do a... As a matter of fact, if it thought, say, pretend for some reason the pneumatic system didn't work and the upper stage was still stuck onto the first stage and it tried to do its boost, it would still try to do its like boost back maneuver probably all attached, but it it wouldn't know that it, you know, it probably wouldn't know if some, I mean, I, I don't know what I'm saying right now. Basically, I don't think that could happen besides it'd be very unaerodynamically stable um, with a mostly empty first stage uh, and a full second stage with a payload. Uh, the grid fins would be in the middle of the, uh, you know, upper two thirds of the vehicle instead of near the very, very top of the vehicle. Uh, it just wouldn't, it, 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 no, it, short answer, no, it can't do that. Um, but thank you, Peter <laughs> McKenzie. Hey McKenzie, how are you? Uh, when you get back from a three week, no phone holiday, missing a really cool launch only to watch an expendable mission. <laughs> oh, well, love you, Tim. Well, thanks McKenzie. Yeah, it is a bit of a shame that it is, um, you know, that it, that it was expendable, but it was still a big, big mission for SpaceX and a good way to close out the year. Uh, Mars Mountain, Merry Christmas, Tim. Thanks for our awesome, awesome videos in 2018. Well, thank you, Mars. Uh, stay tuned for 2019. I promise I will have the best videos I've ever made in 2019 by far. I am, I have a list this long and it's continually getting longer and longer and some really, really big things planned in 2019. So uh, get ready, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> and Alex, uh, Alice answered our prayers. Uh, I had to look that up during the coast phase. Uh, our Discord channel <laughs> told me what it is. The god of the was a Greek god of weather. So thank you for the chuckle. That's that's good. Uh, yes, that we we had a, a successful launch. That is a very very good thing. Um, and then so thank you, Alex and Tyler. Yay, no scrubs. Yes, <laughs> intelligent intuition. Happy Rocket Day, end of Scrub Sember. Thanks for your awesome channel. Well, thank you, Intelligent Intuition. Thank you very much. I am very, very pleased that this, uh, I think this will be the last launch of the year that I know of. Uh, I guess, I guess I probably shouldn't say that. I should probably double check my own website, huh? <laughs> and see if it is the last launch. I, I don't think Delta IV Heavy still has not gone, but they're currently targeting the 30th, which probably means, um, that's just a placeholder date. I guess there's quite a few more, actually. There's still a Soyuz launch and a Long March. Okay. There's a few more launches this year. Um, but And maybe we'll see Delta IV Heavy. But I, I'm guessing that'll end up being near the first of the year. Um, Kevin, thank you very much. Uh, hi. And Chris, Ma, Mon and Tim, man. <laughs> is that what that is? <laughs> Thanks, Chris. Uh Drove, drove Donge, thank you very much. Hi, Tamer. Tim, thanks for all the content. Staying strong to, to staying strong to stream this launch. I didn't want to. I'll tell you that. This was like, this was my final straw. I was like, I am not doing this all over again. I haven't even, like, I've been going to bed, trying to go to bed early, you know, missing out on hanging out with friends that are in town, uh, you know, for the holidays. Uh, like, all my friends were out the past two nights, and I had to say no. I, I saw some uh, Friday night, but... I was like, guys, I got to get up really early, so I can't, I can't be hanging out too late. So, um, yeah, I'm glad this finally <laughs> went. I'm really glad. Um, oh, I let's see, I missed uh, Tamer. Thanks for all the all the content. Thanks for oh yeah, there the Atlas Four 
the Atlas Force scopes are hard for me. They're at 5 a.m. my time zone. I feel it. Like, yeah. Oh, yeah. Delta Force heavy uh, are, are hard. I agree, Tamer. I am glad we are on. Yeah. <laughs> and thank you, Joel. Skyline is the closest to an air launch vehicle. Mm, I disagree, Joel. I think Skyline's about the furthest from an air launch vehicle we have right now. Um, it is honestly nowhere near flying, really. There's... It'll be at best a decade before anything close to a Skyline really flies, most likely. There's a lot of development that needs to be done on both the air-breathing engines and, of course, the fuselage and all the 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 vehicle. The closest thing we have to an air launch vehicle currently is is easily Virgin Orbit with their um, Galactic Girl. Is that what it's called? Galactic Girl? They're, they're 747. That will be launching. They'll be launching an orbital rocket from a 747 here really soon. Um, hopefully, at the beginning of 2019. That is the closest. I don't know of anyone else that is all up, ready to go with a vehicle done that is ready to launch. Um, Strata Launch will probably be the next closest to an air launch vehicle that's anything like that. Um, that is the biggest uh, airplane, the biggest air vehicle ever made. It's so big that you can carry what would be close to a Falcon 9 in rocket size up to the upper atmosphere. Um, and then launch from there. I'll be doing a video about why I really don't think air launch is the answer per se it just honestly does not give you that much more delta v is the main reason like it's not worth the hassle potentially again rockets rockets are always a compromise rocketry and aerospace is always a compromise yes something might work on paper but putting it into practice is an entirely different thing um drug dodge Oh, but thank you, Joel. Drove Dodge. Uh, ISRO is going to use second stage as a satellite. Thoughts? Yes, I did see that. Um, it makes sense. If you're going to be putting things into a graveyard orbit anyway, I see it as being very advantageous to potentially have solar panels and some of the systems that are already in place on an upper stage. Why not reuse that for a satellite? It makes sense. At the same time, though, uh, yeah, it makes sense. I think it's a pretty cool concept. Um, the only problem is you're, you know, hmm. now you're carrying around a bunch of extra. So now you're carrying a ton of payload. Like you have, you're still holding onto a super heavy engine, giant tanks. So now if you need to make any kind of adjustments with your satellite, you're not just adjusting the tiny satellite. You're adjusting the entire stage and having to move that around with. So now your tanks in order to do any kind of maneuvering in space, maneuvering or any kind of station keeping, you you require much, much, much larger tanks to do that same amount of station keeping, that same amount of maneuvering. Uh, it it makes sense. I get it. But I'm, I'm wondering, there's always a reason why things like that probably haven't been done in the past. And it might just be because, you know what? It's easier to detach the satellite, let the satellite have a small amount of propellant on board to be able to do station keeping rather than holding on to the second stage. And... I mean, we'll see. I'm excited to see if they come up with some really cool, clever way of making it more viable and making it a, a really useful system. Um, but as far as like using an upper stage as a satellite bus, there's already, I mean, we're, that's what a satellite is for, basically. <laughs> I don't know. It's confusing to me, but interesting. I want to see more about it. Um, I'm excited for ISRO. They, I mean, they're doing cryogenic upper stages already. Uh, very cool. Uh, I need to be doing a video about ISRO very soon and all the cool things they've been working on, especially in like the past decade. They've done an insane amount. So, yeah. Um, Chris Harris, uh, SpaceX boosters all controlled by Kerbals, too. <laughs> this is true. This is true. You're right. There are little green Kerbals in every booster. So, of course, they could probably just land with the payload attached. No problem. Uh, <laughs> Renau, thank you for another great launch coverage with the two side boosters already on their way to the Cape. If not there already, do you think we'll see Falcon Heavy launch in the next few months? Yes, I do. I'm really hoping to see Falcon Heavy fly already. I think there's the potential for like late February, early March. It'd be cool if it was the one year anniversary, but I'm guessing the one year anniversary of Falcon Heavy will line up closer to DM1. But I, I think Falcon Heavy will be soon. Really soon. I, uh, yeah, I can't wait for that mission. That's going to be absolutely amazing. Uh, hopefully they nail the center core recovery and, and we we see their whole system play out here with three cores being reusable. That will be absolutely amazing. Um, so thank you, Renau. Uh, uh, Tune, why is there ice on the second stage forming? 
it looks like it's leaking and thank you for your awesome content thank you greetings from the netherlands well so there is so li there is liquid oxygen that's really 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 cold in these upper stages but it still has boil off so occasionally uh it still gets a little bit too warm turns into uh it purges out they 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 let go of it basically it comes out these valves and then i'm guessing it turns right back into a, a solid uh or then it freezes into a solid and it's and it's purged out like it's just that's actually the the big problem that's the hard part about having a cryogenic upper stage so something that uses liquid hydrogen which is even colder than liquid oxygen um that's the hard thing about having those as upper stages is by the time you get out to your like pay like say you have to do a coast phase like this it's really hard to keep all your fuel and oxidizer cold long enough because if it all of a sudden warms up too much uh you won't have anything left in your tanks by the time you're ready to ignite your your upper stage so um yeah i'm not entirely sure if it just then freezes right back into ice but it is normal to have a little bit of pss, like purging while it's in space there um and thank you the three-sided coin stainless steel was a uh, no duh sea dragon was stainless steel was sea dragon stainless steel or was sea dragon like literally just steel i think sea dragon's concept was like literally just use like bulk steel like make just like a shipping container basically you know make a, a big heavy uh tanker ship you know uh I don't know if they're actually talking about using stainless steel for uh, for Sea Dragon, but yeah, it. it I'm, I'm diving into it right now. I'm looking at the like alloy strength. You know, if you're talking about a, a stainless steel versus aluminum, all that stuff. I'm actually going to be talking to my dad. He he used to build uh, bicycle frames, so he used a lot of different alloys um, like chromoly and things like that to build uh, high end bicycle frames like race bikes and stuff back when I was young. So I'm going to be, I have a lot of questions about kind of like metal. I don't understand that stuff very well. So I'm going to be talking to him. I, I hope he has some good insight for me. Um, so I, I yeah, I, cause I don't have a, that's like that. Now we're getting to like, like metallurgy or is that how you even say it? See, I don't even know enough about metallurgy to say the word correctly. So I've got a long day of reading ahead of me. I've found a couple NASA papers that talk about comparing like um, aluminum alloy to stainless steel and even comparing it to carbon fiber, carbon ca carbon composite. So I'm gonna be doing a video all about why uh, why stainless steel does or hopefully does make sense as as the uh, the tank for the rocket formerly known as BFR slash Starship Super Heavy. All right, uh, Paul, when are you going to have a one to one with Elon? I don't know. I I'm ready for it, but I'm realizing now we definitely should wait until. He's ready to show off the new uh, rocket formerly known as BFR Starship Super Heavy. Um, by the way, that's a, that's a, a term I'm just going to start coining from now on. I, I probably will say it all the way like that every time. <laughs> so sorry in advance, at least for a while. Um, let's see. Let's see. Uh, sorry, I'm just trying to make sure we're talking about a, what, ba, ba, some marine hull for, for Sea Dragon. Yeah. <laughs> that's crazy. Um, I would, so I, I think we need to really wait until he's ready to talk more about Starship and then, then we'll see if we can get something set up. But meanwhile, I don't know. I'm not really asking him for interviews anymore. So if you guys want an interview, if you think a sit down interview between the two of us would be beneficial. And if you think we would get some good information, uh, with the two of us having a conversation, uh, take to Twitter if you want and let him know you know, maybe later, maybe like March, April, when they're, when that's in the news cycle, when he's out talking about it, let's see if we can pin him down then to, to do some stuff about Starship. But meanwhile, I think, you know, they don't have a ton of stuff to show off right now. They don't have a lot of things to necessarily talk about per se. So, um, yeah, so yeah, we'll see. Um, so thank you, Paul. And thank you so much to, uh, to this individual here. Uh, I wish I could read those characters. I can't, but thank you. Launchpad Astronomy, how are you doing? Uh, thanks for all you do, Tim. Your channel inspired me to get serious about mine. Have a Merry Christmas and hope to see you on the New Year's stream. Um, yeah, well, thank you, Launchpad. What's the New Year's stream? Oh, I have an email from you. Um, I'm not sure if I can commit to anything on New Year's. I have a bit of things going on on New Year's, but... Yes, I will get back to you on that. Uh, thanks for saying hi. Uh, yeah, I, I need to. I need to get back to you on that. 
I, I had to, I have New Year's plans at this point, but I do want to do that. I'll, I'll look at, I'll look at the times and see if there's a time that I can sneak away or something. Uh, Peter, the velocity they stopped at was at le low Earth orbit, um, so 28,000 kilometers an hour. To get up to Mio, 33,480 kilometers an hour. Um, and for our abort discussion, I want to believe <laughs> uh, 60s in. They know stage two will fail uh, trying to land, nothing to lose. Um, yeah, I, I see what you're saying. I th The thing is, I just don't know. The vehicle, I don't think, is going to make dynamic decisions about if anything, like I said, it might accidentally go along its regular, you know, regimen. But the problem is if you all of a sudden have, you know, 50% more weight on top of the vehicle and it's planned, it knows it's, you know, I need to do my re-entry burn at this speed at this time. Uh, and I need to do my landing burn at this, at this point. It, I don't know if it would know that it's 50% too heavy. It's going to be going significantly faster and need a lot more Delta V to stop. I just can't really see it happening, but yes, sorry, Peter. Uh, uh, yeah, we'll see though. Joel, thanks, Tim. Uh, uh, Fro, oh, 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 I should not try to even remotely speak German. Uh, congrats on our comms with you. Well, thank you, Joel. There, we did it, guys. We did it. We got through comments. Uh, thank you, guys. So yeah, we're, we're, wow, that, this is a long coast phase. This is a, this is like an, how long do they say? Is it an hour long coast phase? I, I told, I said earlier, I'm pretty sure they said it was like two and a half minutes from lift off to, to stage deploy. And I am not going to be live streaming for two and a half hours. Did I say minutes or hours? I'm not going to be live streaming today for two and a half hours. Um, 57 minutes. All right. Dang. Dang, 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 dang. Uh, well, uh, you know what we're going to do? We can look at, uh, oh, I forgot to talk about with Elon here. Uh, there was more to this. As a matter of fact, hang on. Let me pull this up here. There was a little bit more to this. Uh, let's see. Oh yeah, here we go. So there was a side discussion here. So, um, here we go. This is more. Who makes the alloy? SpaceX is the supplier. When talking about the early Atlas rockets and stainless steel, uh, you know, I had this video here about an unpressurized Atlas. What happens when it is goes unpressurized? Um, the only significant design element is in common with early Atlas is stainless steel. And, and he says, we're using a different alloy mix. I super love 300 series stainless. And uh, Martin asks, who makes that alloy? SpaceX or supplier? Elon says, for sheet plate, at supplier made to our spec for cast in our Hawthorne foundry. That's cool. And just a tinker cast ribbing. And then Elon says cold formed at cryo. I'll have to look into cast ribbing. I don't quite get some of this talk. Like I said, I'm not a, I don't know really any of this stuff. So I'll have to read up and figure out what all this is. Um, and then Tom asks launching Starlink from Starship. And Elon says Starlink version one on Falcon version two plus on Starship. So future generations of Starlink. Basically all future products will contain either the word star or link. I like that. And then Chris B from NASA space flight. While we have you, Elon, how well is Raptor performing during test stand firings at McGregor on track to support your super heavy starship schedule. And Elon says, yes, radically redesigned, ready Raptor, ready to fire next month, a redesign, a radically redesigned Raptor. I want to know what happened. I want to know, I'm wondering if at some point they are continually refining and tweaking the Raptor engine realized it's significantly more powerful or, you know, maybe they got uh, a little bit of extra, uh, a little extra Delta V or, or not Delta V, sorry, a little extra um, specific impulse out of it. And then they realized they can give up on trying to pursue carbon composites because they can do what they need to do easily with stainless steel because now these Raptor engines are more powerful or something. And I said, Still full flow closed cycle. Don't tell me you're going beyond 300 bar, which is 300 atmospheres um, of pressure, which is the internal pressure of the combustion chamber. 300 is insane. So he says, yes, full flow gas, gas, staged combustion. Um, will take us time to work up to 300 bar. That is mad level. And um, then I believe this conversation continues. I said, that is mad level. 
But can we all agree that the RD-170 has been a little too comfortable at number one for too long at 265 bar? So right now, the current king of high pressure chamber pressure is the Russian RD-170. It's the four chamber version of the RD-180, which is a two ta- chamber version of the RD-170. Um, and then all those are, are kind of related to like the um, the NK-33 Long story, it's all this weird like tangent. So RD-170 currently holds the the combustion chamber pressure, the highest amount of combustion chamber pressure at 265 bar currently. And I said, here's hoping for 300. Elon said, it's embarrassing that Boeing and Lockheed need to use a Russian engine on Atlas, but that engine design is brilliant. <laughs> and Trevor Mallman. Oh, that's funny. Shade. I love that. Trevor, you, you always win with the gifts. That's funny. Um... So yeah, so and then there's a side by side mock up of some pieces out at the uh, out at Boca Chica. Pretty stinking cool, exciting stuff, guys. Exciting, exciting stuff. I cannot wait. Um, no, uh, someone's asking if the launch got scrubbed. Nope, the launch went off. We are. Oh, I'm down to less than potato quality here. What is going on? Uh, 36 minutes. Whew, that's a lot better. 36 minutes and 17 seconds after. Uh, launch. So we're just in this long, hour-long coast phase, basically. So we're reading things. Uh, and Chad, how do you plan launch trips? Ooh. Uh, so tough to plan a trip from Iowa to catch one without launch delays changing. Trust me, Chad. I, You're speaking my language. Uh, and hi from Sioux City. Well, hello from the other side of the state. Um, launch trips are very hard. What you want to do is you want to find the most packed, like, you want to find launches where there's two or three things all planned within about one week. And then you want to aim for like the, the middle of that because most likely any, so say you're six months out, plan on it being like, I feel like you can add about a third to any launch date you see. So if you see something that's six months away, it's eight months away. If you see something three months away, it's four months away. Um, you know, like for every three months you add a month. So even three weeks, I still say it's probably more like four weeks. That just seems to be about what happens with, with with launches. There's so many reasons, so many reasons for delays and scrubs and, and time changes and, and this and that and this and that. And um yeah, it's it's nor like that's that's normal. So just look for an area in the like for instance, we could probably find a time here where there's multiple launches all within a week from the same, you know, from from Kennedy Space Center, if you look back. It's definitely worth, but some of the bigger missions, say like DM1, like a NASA mission, um, lots of times those seem to be more time critical. Although the first launch I ever tried that I went down to see was CRS-3, and I w- went to the airport twice before I actually like made it down because it kept scrubbing like literally like two days, three days before. Um, so the, and then I also have a video. Um, where to see rockets in Florida. If you watch um, the best places to watch a rocket launch in Florida, that thumbnail is not very good, guys. I might need to update that again. Uh, but this is an in-depth guide on like literally where to go, uh, all the like planning and things you need to see, even like where all the launch pads are. Um, this was, look back in the spacesuit days. Um, this shows all the launch pads. This shows your potential viewing sites. Um, there's also an accompanying thing here. So if you're going to see a rocket launch, watch this video. The best places to watch a rocket launch in Florida. Or you can find this. It's also an article-based version of it as well. Where to watch rockets in Florida. Has all that run down here. Um, yeah. There you go. That's that's my advice on trying to watch a rocket. It is very, very, very hard thing to do. Um, yeah, unfortunately, but it's great. It's definitely, definitely, definitely worth it. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I literally am going to be with you on this one because I think it's going to be, I'm hoping to make it down to the Cape about five times this year. Um, I'm hoping for DM one, DM two, Boeing's OFT one, and, um, at their two first missions, also, I want to see the in-flight abort, and I also, oh man, five, six, I also want to see Falcon Heavy again. So there's potential for six launches that I might be going down to see in person. So I'm with you. It's going to be a hard, scary year of trying to get launches. I mean, I don't even know. Uh, yeah. 
Um, and someone also earlier asked about the models in my videos. This is this is where you can see like Buzz here. If you click on partners, you can click on Buzz Space Buzz Space models, and you can get these rockets from from Ollie. They are crazy high detailed. They're like literally handmade, three D printed, and hand painted when you get them all finished. So they're awesome. Um, yeah, there you go. Vipercrest, your content is awesome, but did you hear the background reporting of the uh, Andoya test rocket? No, I did not hear the background reporting of the Andoya test rocket. Love your hard work and uh, love of space. Thank you from Norway. Well, thank you, Vipercrest. Unfortunately, no, I don't. I don't know. Uh, I didn't hear the background reporting. Was that you? If so, great work. And also, thank you so much for your generous tip. Um, but yeah, I, I started to read about the Andoya rocket. It's pretty sweet. Good work there. Scandinavia is fantastic. Um, would, uh, let's see. Everydayastronaut.com. That's funny. So, and also, friendly reminder, I have these new shirts. I'm glad to see that the Starship is starting to staying kind of similar to this uh, because this shirt's brand new. <laughs> I hope that it still looks similar to uh, to what's on this shirt, but these are definitely like one of the uh, best sellers we've had for the past couple of weeks. Again, friendly reminder that we don't do print on demand for the shop. It is all hand uh, s uh, screen pressed. These are like much higher quality shirts than what I uh, used to have with print on demand stuff, which is great. But that being said, they are like manually fulfilled. No robots. We don't want the robot overlords taking all of our jobs. But we also have this limited edition Apollo 8 shirt because we are coming up. Uh, the, the 21st was the anniversary of the launch 50th anniversary of humans leaving earth uh they arrived to the moon on what ended up being christmas eve so the 24th so tomorrow will be uh kind of the anniversary of that so i do have these limited edition apollo 8 shirts that are awesome and i did want i don't know if i have even shown this one off yet guys but i also have these cool like asds ones by the way um asds style ones the drone ship landing these are also a pretty hot seller now. So check those out, everydayastronaut.com slash shop. And of course, if you work for an aerospace company, if you work at you know SpaceX, NASA, ULA, uh, Blue Origin, uh, Rocket Lab, wherever, if, if you work for an aerospace company, click here, you can take 25% off. You just have to submit um, your work email that proves you work for those aerospace companies. It literally, all it does is bounces you a, a coupon code back. We don't keep your email on any list or anything. There's no... You're not even buying any items through that. There's nothing. All we're doing is confirming that you do work in the aerospace industry automatically. Um, click there. You can take 25% off. That is a thank you from me to you for helping inspire me do, doing what I do. If you guys weren't out there building rockets and doing awesome things, uh, I wouldn't be excited. I wouldn't have anything to talk about. And it's literally all thanks to you. So um, that is my thank you to you. So anything in apparel is 25% off if you work in the aerospace industry. So thank you. Um, Let's see here. And Paul, uh, or sorry, uh, oh yeah, wait, mm, furs. Still ridiculous to think the mere ancient rocket design of of the Soviets is still up to the task these days. Imagine Cold War didn't happen and we mankind worked together instead. We'd be on Mars. Well, actually, I don't know if, I totally agree with that sentiment. Trust me, I'm like the biggest, like, let's work together. Everyone, we can be together. Um, I'm with you on that 100%. But at the same time, I do think some of it is like the competition drives innovation quite a bit. And, you know, that's some of the reason why I think that we kind of stalled in the, in the space. After the space race, we really didn't do that much crazy, fast pace innovation um, throughout like the 70s, 80s, 90s, early 2000s. I think the only reason we're seeing um, a lot more innovation now is because we do have competition between the private sector and um you know, the private sectors are actually competing against each other. So that's one of the reasons we're starting to see everyone pursuing reusability, pursuing advanced things like carbon, carbon fiber, 3D printed engines, uh, electric turbo pumps. We're seeing these crazy things that were considered almost too hard to do. We're seeing them happen. So I, I agree with you. That being said, yeah, the Soviet engines, Soviet air engines are still phenomenal. I mean, to this day, no one else has done an oxygen rich uh, kerosene closed closed cycle engine ever the the they literally had to come up with this crazy materials that could even handle that that could survive that and to this day it's still unmatched so it's um yeah as we saw in that tweet elon's like they're still impressive basically but it's kind of a shame that we're having to rely on 
50 year old engines, basically 40 year old engines, um, in our, in, in some of those vehicles. So yeah. And Paul, Merry Christmas. Thank you. All I want for Christmas is a Falcorn heavy merch. Ugh, you guys, I'll, I will get Falcorn heavy shirts someday. I'm just so nervous. I'll make Falcorn heavy and then no one will buy it. And then I'll have a run of all these shirts because again, I don't do print on demand. If I do Falcorn heavy, let me know if you guys actually genuinely want a Falcorn heavy shirt. And I, don't say yes, I want it. If you think it's funny, but you wouldn't buy it because if you, I, I need to know so that I, so that I don't make a hundred shirts and then have them sitting in a warehouse in California. Like that's just not, that's not good. <laughs> okay. Just take pre-orders. Yeah, but then the pre-order thing, here's the deal. I only, I'm trying to only do pre-orders once a month for special space fight events because I have no idea how those are going to do. So we're doing those very limited run, limited edition and pre-orders. People always get like, we had so many emails with people like, where's my order for my Buran shirt? Uh, which was like in November. And you know, the thing was like, these are pre-orders. You won't get them until December. Like that was said in the description. So I, the less I had to do the pre-order stuff, I don't want to make people upset when they like maybe don't realize that they might be waiting a month for their shirt. Um, so I'd rather do runs on shirts. I want my store to be uh, on top of it. We're trying really hard. Again, this is all new to me and uh, the guy doing all the, the store, we have like overrun his, his whole business. So he's trying really hard to keep up. Um, yeah. Falcorn shirt, Falcorn heavy shirt. Jeez. Okay. Maybe I'll do a small run of them. I'll do a small, uh, Fal so oh, people are asking what is Falcorn? So I'm from Iowa and of course everyone just assumes everything in Iowa is corn related and that the only thing we'd ever build in Iowa is a corn rocket. Everything's corn powered. So Falcorn heavy. There you go. <laughs> um, let's see here. So, uh, Tyler, would like to see you do a video on Lockheed's Mar Lockheed Martin's lander and how it compares to BFR. I wonder how it'll work in Mars atmosphere. Tyler, I would like to do that too. Uh, they had the Mars base camp lander that they showed off in both 2016 and 2017. Then this year they're showing off a, a moon lander, a large moon, lander, a really big moon lander. Um, I want to see more stuff from Lockheed. They just, at this point, um, they don't seem to be too, uh, I feel like they aren't as worried about like getting us to Mars on their own. Like that's not their, like their mission background. When you walk into to Lockheed Martin, isn't like we're going to Mars as soon as possible. Like that's not their mantra. You know, they're more of a traditional aerospace company. And the idea that like, if they're, if a customer is like, Hey, we're going to Mars, get us to Mars, like insight lander or, you know, some of the other things they've done. Yeah. They'll build it and they will knock it out of the park. You know, they totally are the the kings of putting things on mars currently um but i i don't see them doing a lander without like a very very big congressional budget for a human mars lander mission and it, we wouldn't see anything concrete from that lander presentation or from any kind of landing hardware unless they had it uh you know uh, a mission to do so really um that just seems to be the the way they work more or less um and again, it's probably more from like the defense industry standards, but yeah, uh, I would like to see more on their landers because I think they're awesome. They look really, really cool. Their their Martian lander looks really cool. I actually really like that moon lander personally, though. That looks like a, a thing that I would really like to to see happen. So, um, so maybe Tyler, maybe if they give us more to work on. I, I don't like doing videos about like just a paper, total paper rocket. I want, I need numbers. That's why I waited until we had the payload users guide for New Glenn. Um, people are still saying that's a paper rocket, guys. It's not a paper rocket. It's less of a paper rocket in some cases than BFR. Um, they haven't. They're they're along the same development, and they both have engines basically done or getting close to done. They both have. Um, you know, they both also have uh, the tankage ready for fuselages and things like that. Uh, you know, I mean, they're, yeah, the, they're they're already having paying customers for New Glenn, including the U.S. Air Force. It's not a paper rocket. Uh, otherwise, I wouldn't have done a video about it. That That's the standard. Paper rocket. No videos. Total paper rockets. Um, 
Renau, really do agree with your sentiment on competition needing needed for innovation. You can see in all specs, aspects of life, please bring Falcorn. <laughs> Gosh. Is this just going to be what it is from now on? Just constant Falcorn heavy requests? I mean, I get it. I get it. <laughs> Peter, I will buy. Corny is the way to go. Wow, I did not know Falcorn Heavy was going to be that desired. The question is then, do we make it to the smoke? No, I just answered it myself. We'll do Falcorn Heavy. We'll do Falcorn Heavy. Uh, maybe we'll do it. My birthday's in February. Maybe that'll be my birthday shirt. Stay tuned. Uh, Amy Donk. Do you ever think someone will photograph the Starman and the car in the future? Oh my gosh. Uh, uh, Ami Donk, I want that more than anything. I So someday, okay, so don't forget Starman is in uh, an elliptical orbit, a uh, heliocentric elliptical orbit, meaning it's in a kind of wonky orbit, goes out beyond Mars, but its lowest point is still here at Earth around the sun. So it's, it's orbiting the sun, and it will come close to Earth every now and then. As a matter of fact, I think in about two years' time from when it launched... It'll be the closest, or maybe it's even less than that. It'll be the closest it'll be in a long time again. In order to go out there, I don't think a human will probably go photograph it, but it would be so, so awesome to send a payload up to go look at it and see how much has deteriorated, how much has been um, torn away by radiation, things like, all, you know, all the carbon has, has been dissipated or whatever. Like, there's, oh, it'd be so cool. It would be so, so, so cool. Um. Let's see. Uh, can you explain your f philosophy on not doing print on demand? It would help your supply chain and merchandise sales. Well, Joel, here's the deal with print on demand. I did print on demand for the first like two years of having merchandise. Um, print on demand. The problem is the the direct to garment printing. It flakes away. Like it literally like can wear out. I have shirts that are fl almost entirely flaked off now. It's it, the quality typically is not nearly as great. Um, the problem is too, I, I needed to have a team of people that can actually answer emails um, and doing direct to garment, uh, working with a big corporation like that. I had people all the time needing to send something back because they would get like the wrong shirt. They'd get holes in their shirts. They had holes in their hats. There's like no quality control and the margin, they charged me like 20 bucks for a shirt. They would charge me like eight bucks for shipping internationally or 10 bucks for shipping. I was losing money on some shirts because I wanted to try to sell them at a reasonable price. And I wanted to try to sell them at like the $24 price mark. And best case scenario, I'd make four bucks on a shirt. Worst case scenario, I would lose money on those shirts. So in order to actually make it worth the time and money to even do a non-print on demand, it actually makes sense to do them in large runs. We can get shirts, uh, high, much, much higher quality shirts, much higher quality shirts and prints, um, and higher quality like prints and other merchandise. I can sell things that aren't shirts in this new shop. Um, I have way more versatility. Yes, it's more of a risk. Like I had to do these big bulk runs. We might get out of stock on some things, but it just makes way, way, way more sense. Um, yeah. And now we have like exact shipping rates and everything all automatically calculated based on the actual weight. So I won't all of a sudden end up with like losing $3 getting a shirt to England or something, you know? Um, yeah, because that is how that happened, by the way. I think for the first two years of my store, I can't tell you how many times I'd like look at my report and be like, oh, I, I, I lost money on some shirts. <laughs> like, and I don't think that's, I'm not trying to make a, like a killing off of a, a shirt store or anything, but at the same time, like, I don't think I should be losing money, <laughs> like just giving merch away basically. Um, yeah, that's why, that's why. Dang it, Michael, you've, you read my mind, Michael Muir. Popcorn smoke. You, you read my mind. How did you do that? Was I that obvious? Confirmed, Falcorn Heavy will have popcorn smoke coming off all three of its delicious cores. Falcorn Heavy, everybody. <laughs> uh, Cheesy Doritos wants to know, why is he an everyday astronaut if you're not even an astronaut? See, that's the point. You don't need to be an astronaut to appreciate spaceflight. You don't need to be an astronaut to get excited about space exploration. You can be a normal everyday person and be engaged and excited and enthusiastic and supportive of spaceflight endeavors. I literally, 
you know, beginning at two years ago today, I was still considered a full-time professional photographer. I had a career in, uh, in photography. I was shooting weddings literally all over the world. I shot 150 weddings, uh, in my, in my career. It was going very well. It was going really, really, really well. Um, but it wasn't what I was passionate about, you know, and, and I had to just like follow that obsession. And I, I started having to say no to paying very good paying gigs, uh, and really exciting opportunities as a photographer because I didn't think it was worth it because I wanted to help other people get excited about space flight. I, I realized I'm sitting here spending hours a day reading about this stuff, literally spending like all of my free time learning about this stuff and loving it, like absolutely falling in love with the science, you know, just it, it, it's exciting. It's stuff that like I would wake up in the middle of the night and like get back and start and read, you know, like almost going on like those Einstein sleep schedules or whatever that or, and Da Vinci where you like sleep for three hours and you get woken up by excitement almost and, and going back and reading watching all these videos just getting excited and through that excitement I just realized like I want everyone else to get excited about this because it's it's important I think it's important for our, our the future of humanity I think it's exciting it's something to look forward to instead of being sad about the state of things being excited about what Div Hmm, sorry, I just heard something over comms. Um, be excited about things um, coming up. It's something to look forward to. I think that drives society a lot more than uh, people that are negative. You'll see you'll see hate comments all the time. On if, if you're out there trying to do something different, trying to do something good, um, working hard, doing something that might have been impossible or, or nonsensical or fun or funny or artistic, you're going to get hate for it. Because there's going to be people out there that don't like what you're doing. They're just going to say, that's stupid. And as a creative person, as a creator, someone that's creating content, that's hard because I'm sitting here going like, look at all this exciting stuff. Why wouldn't you be excited? Why wouldn't you have something positive to look forward to? Something optimistic. Like, I'm a huge optimist. I Space flight is purely optimistic. You look at the insane things, you know, 60 years ago, if people weren't optimistic about putting things into space... What would we have today? I mean, like literally think about a world where we hadn't discovered how to put things in orbit. We wouldn't have, I mean, all of the apps and stuff we use every single day rely on spaceflight. Absolutely would not exist without spaceflight. Um, so much. And I, I'm just a huge fan of, you know, you don't need to be working for NASA. You don't need to be working for SpaceX. You don't need to be working for these companies to at least be excited and help shape a culture of scientific literacy and critical thinking and scientific importance. And, and we can be as excited about this stuff as people are excited about football. How many people do you know watch football, either American or soccer, uh, watch a sport that they maybe only played for a, a few years or never played in their life? You don't need to be an athlete to enjoy sports. You don't need to be a rocket scientist to enjoy space flight. You know, or you don't need to be an astronaut to enjoy spaceflight. It is for everybody. It's everyday astronaut. Like that's the whole, sorry, this is a total rant. That's the whole point. That's the whole point is that all of us are in this together. And yeah, boom. That's, that's what's up. Um, <laughs> I guess our discord channel, everybody was thinking about the same lines of how to integrate popcorn somehow on your shirt. The popcorn smoke is good though. Okay, good. <laughs> Um, let's see. Okay. So, um, popcorn smoke. Yeah. Who, who prints your shirts? Also love your streams. Um, it is a shop in California called, um, oh man, it's my friend Andrew's shop. I can't, um, can't even think of what it's called, but they're in Long Beach, a small, very small shop, like tiny little place that they're just working full time doing screen printing now. I mean, they are going nuts. Um, yeah, that's who prints them. Um, thank you, MV Bocal. Uh, just, just show the video. Yeah, there. That's true. I, I think we, we owe ourselves, uh, a little Elon Musk reacting to Falcon Heavy. Just watch this. Just watch this and tell me that. Let's see. Landing. I don't remember if this is, um, let's see here. 
I mean, you've all seen this. Elon reacting to the Falcon Heavy launch. This is now getting flagged right away. If that doesn't make you, I mean, I feel like there's more reaction to that, but if that doesn't make you excited, Acquisition signal I mean, come on, like that is, that is, uh, I just love that stuff, like, and there was like 200,000 people out at the Cape that were cheering for a rocket. Like, think about that. It's just game changing. It's just, it's just game changing. I mean, I love it. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah, who was there? Raise your hand or say me if you were at Falcon Heavy. That was, that was life changing. I mean, that was a big, big, big event. And if you think Falcon Heavy was big, wait until we start flying humans on these rockets for uh, for DM2 and for Boeing CST-100 Starland. One of the commercial crew program is back up and at them. Uh, yeah, you, if you thought that was big, you're in for a surprise because those are going to be big missions because there is that human element. Those are, there's that connection to oh my word, there's another human being on top of that 22-story uh, tall rocket, a 70-meter tall rocket, and is going to be breaking free from Earth's gravity uh, and and going out into space and exploring like there, there's that that causes even more excitement so I can't wait those are gonna be huge missions um, yeah and then not only that then you think about the next generation of rockets when we start doing the rocket formerly known as BFR Starship Super Heavy and New Glenn um, and if SLS flies like we're gonna see some big 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 rockets fly Falcon Heavy is awesome Falcon Heavy was like the greatest thing that's happened uh, in the 21st century of spaceflight, in my opinion. Um, but this is just the beginning. There's so much more. Um, yeah, I, I love it. And oh, you're right. Yeah, uh, uh, Nira Seiko in our Discord. I'm glad they talked about that on tomorrow yesterday. That people really liked the payload because of Starman, and it felt like a human connection to launch. Exactly. See, Starman was like that that human element, that connection that now you can. You, you connect with Falcon Heavy in a way that you don't connect to other rockets, uh, at least the, the initial launch of Falcon Heavy. You connect to it because you're seeing a car, something that we're all familiar with, something that we see every single day, now in space, with a, you know, with a dummy sitting there that helps you realize like the scale of this and the sense of this. That's exactly right. Like Falcon Heavy is yeah, like, totally game changing. Um, Let's see, for now, couldn't get to Florida for Falcon Heavy, but would love to, to be there for one, or even BFR slash spaceship, BFR slash spaceship, but did watch it through your live stream. Well, thank you, Renau. Uh, hopefully next time I do a live stream from the Cape, I'm working on a really good streaming solution that will actually give me beyond potato quality at a launch. So hopefully the next time you guys see me at a launch with a, a live stream from a launch, It'll be this quality of video, this quality of production, only instead of me sitting here in my house in Iowa, uh, I'll be sitting three miles away from the rocket at the press site of Kennedy Space Center. Um, that's what I'm talking about. That'll be awesome. So stay tuned for that. And when, we, when I do those, by the way, when, when we'll be doing, like if I'm in person at upcoming rocket launches, I'll be live streaming way ahead of time because I'll actually have stuff to talk about. You know, like I'll, I'll be able to sit there and do some way more preamble because you know, you'll at least be able to see the stage, see things warming up and all those things too. Um, uh, one caveat, I'm not ready to announce this by any means yet, but there's a small chance that I won't actually be live streaming DM1. Just keep that in mind, very small, uh, small chance. And no, it's not that I'm going to be on DM1. <laughs> People, are you riding on DM1? Absolutely not. Of course not. Uh, but there is something that may take up 
my day. So we'll just leave it at that for now. Maybe we'll hear more soon. You're right, music is too loud. You're absolutely right, sorry. Um, why is the second stage pulsing after the fairing drop? So the, the second stage, this this is just uh, like a shielding, uh, a thermal blanket basically wrapped around parts of the second stage there. And there's still things venting nearby it and inside and, and all that. And you'll see that blanket flexing. And also, especially as the second stage is steering, it uses TVC, thrust vector control. You'll see the whole nozzle and the entire engine actually shifts around. And when that when it does that, you'll see the blanket, the thermal blanket moving around quite a bit and it wrinkles Welcome and all that stuff. Ooh. The webcast of the GPS-3 Space Vehicle 1 mission. If you're just joining us, we had a smooth liftoff at 8.51 a.m. Eastern Time, followed by separation of our first and second stages. Uh, we then had a successful lighting and shutdown of the second stage Merlin vacuum engine. Uh, since then, the second stage has been in a coast phase, orbiting around the Earth and boosting up to that desired transfer orbit. The next major event is coming up at T plus one hour, eight minutes, 52 seconds. It's the second relight of our second stage engine called SES number two. Uh, the second stage will burn for much less for 47 seconds uh, before shutting down for a second time. Uh, this event is also similarly called uh, SECO2. First though, we're gonna show a video that provides a recap on the expanded capabilities of GPS-3. Mm. We use GPS every day. Today everyone has GPS technology in their pocket. You know when you go to the ATM you're using GPS? When we talk about GPS and the global positioning system capability, we're really talking about three capabilities. We have position, navigation, and timing. Nowadays, GPS technology empowers farmers to grow more crops more efficiently. So some of our oldest GPS satellites were launched back in the 90s. They are still operational today, but we realize there's a lot of new capabilities that we want to bring to bear and bring to the fight. It helps you find where you need to be. It helps you stay connected to the ones you care most about. And all of this is brought to you by GPS Technology. We want to bring new capabilities to the warfighters, to the nation, and the four billion users around the world. This is the first step of the entire new future of GPS. Now we're going to have second, the second relight of that second stage engine coming up. Again, that's the event SES2, or second engine start two. And that's about less than a minute away. We're actually looking at the second stage engine from a camera mounted on the side. Gives us good visibility and a visual confirmation of engine start when that event happens. So again, less than a minute away before second engine start number two. So those are purge valves you're seeing. It's pressurizing the tanks pre-chilling the engine, getting the engine ready for ignition. And now we see engine ignition. And there Get you can see ignition. on your screen, relight of the second stage engine. Now this is a very short burn, lasting uh, just about 45 seconds. And that's because the MVAC is still producing just as much thrust as it was before, but it's significantly lighter now because we've consumed so much propellant on the way up. A 
MBAC shutdown. And there's confirmation of MBAC shutdown. That's uh, second engine cutoff number two. And we're just going to wait for confirmation of a good orbital insertion. Nominal orbital insertion. And there's that call out for nominal orbital insertion. So we're going to head into a second coast phase now that's going to last about 49 minutes. And when we come out of that coast phase, we'll be back in Air Force ground Expected station coverage. Loss of signal, Western Australia. That's going to be that when we come back from into that Air Force ground station coverage, Acquisition we're going to be of signal, Auckland. ready to deploy the GPS-3 space vehicle. And that's scheduled for about T plus one hours and 58 minutes. So with that, we'll see you back here live in 47 minutes. Oh, man. Crazy, crazy, crazy. Uh, first, thank you, HB and Joel Sapp. Tim, will you be working the DM1 live stream with SpaceX to answer questions from the audience? No, I will not be doing that either. Uh, but there's a... Uh, you'll see, maybe. We'll see. I might be live streaming to you guys from Florida. Might be right here. Who knows? Who knows? Uh, Vipercrest... You're an electrician. My bet for protection of people in space is a combo of water and electromagnetism. What are your thoughts? Ooh, good question, Vipercrest. Um, I think water is a really, really good uh, radiation protection. Oh, cool. That piece of chunk of ice went spinning off into space. Sorry, I very ADD. Um, I think water is actually a great, great solution for um, protecting humans. Uh, against the, the terrible environment of space. Uh, it's, I, it sounds like it's a really good shielding. And yeah, I think that would make a lot of sense. I don't really know too much about uh, using electromagnetism. My guess would be, I mean, you can think of it like the, the Earth obviously has a big electro, electromagnetic field that helps uh, you know protect us from radiation. I'm guessing it would take a very, very, very large amount of electricity to make that happen. And I just can't really... I don't know. I, I don't know enough about that at all to really speculate beyond that. But I think water is is a very common. People are, are wanting to use water to line the walls of vehicles, uh, or at least have some kind of uh, like space radiation safety zone that they can go into, and it's walled within the the water uh, that supplies life for the humans. And it sounds like that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, like I said, guys, I'm actually going to I'm going to duck out now. Like I'm going to go ahead and get out of here. I'm gonna work on that video talking about why uh, stainless steel is probably, it, why stainless steel is the new material for the rocket formerly known as BFR slash Super Heavy, slash Starship Super Heavy. Um, I'll be doing a video about that. We'll be talking about kind of where it's at, all those things. And then, uh, yeah, and we'll talk about why WD-40 might be needed for this vehicle. Uh, I'm gonna try to get it out to you guys by tomorrow for sure. Uh, a lot of stuff for me to read through. I've been reading uh, an 82-page NASA report uh, written earlier this year, oddly enough, about uh, reusable launch vehicles, stainless steel versus aluminum alloy versus carbon fiber. So I've been learning quite a bit. They, they reference the DX, D, DCX, the DCXA. They reference the X-33 quite a bit um, and the Venture Star program. So I've got a lot more reading to do, a lot more research to do to try to figure out as much as I can to bring it down to you guys. Uh, so I'm just gonna go ahead and yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and 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 tune out here uh, I'll be paying attention to the deploy if something for some reason Off nominal would happen. I'll pop back in. I'll kind of be watching it in the background um, But this is already a long enough live stream. I think <laughs> so um, Let me know what questions you guys have um, Yeah, I hope you guys have a fantastic holiday season I don't know if we'll be doing another like public live stream before the new year so if I don't see you guys until then Please have a safe and happy new year. Um, 2019 is going to be, if you thought 2018 was a good year in space flight, uh, 2019 is going to be unbelievable. Like this is going to be the biggest year of space flight that I've ever paid attention to at least by, by a large margin. Uh, it's going to be crazy. Yeah. So if you, if you want to, if you want to join, if you want to also, I'll be doing some, like a, another Patreon live exclusive live stream. If you want to join some of those things, if you, uh, want in on behind the scenes or to join our, our discord channel or our subreddit head on over to patreon.com slash everyday astronaut and thank you so much to those people that support me uh, It's been an amazing year. I can't wait I've got a lot of big plans for next year and they're all possible. Thanks to my patreon supporters So if you guys want 
to help me continue to do what I do, head on over to patreon.com slash everydayastronaut. And of course, like I said, we have these limited run shirts. Um, if you guys do want um, any of those shirts, get them now, especially the, the Apollo shirt ends December 31st. Uh, at midnight Pacific Standard Time. This is a pre-order. They'll ship mid-January. Any or any other order, guys, by the way, the shop, they're taking a holiday. So orders won't ship until the new year anyway. So don't hop on here trying to get holiday like presents or anything. Um, but we have a good amount of stock on everything now. Um, so shop, head on over to everydayastronaut.com slash shop. Or if that's bonked right now, go to shop.everydayastronaut.com. Same thing. Um, yeah, that's going to do it, guys. Uh, stay tuned. I hope we learn a lot more from uh, Elon Musk about the Starship Super Heavy. We'll, we'll see. I'll be paying very close attention to that. Um, oh, sorry. And Steve, hi, Tim. Why is the satellite kept attached to the second stage when no more engine start is planned? I think they mentioned it in the launch, but I don't actually recall. Um, you know, that is a good question, Steve. I don't actually have the exact reason for that. Um, it might be some, yeah, honestly, I, um, yeah, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm actually not sure. I'll, I'll try to figure out, yeah, I'll, I'll see if I can figure it out <laughs> and I'll get back to you on that. But thank you, Steve. Well, thank you guys. Oh yeah. It might be ground tracking. That might be exactly right. Uh, Ruben bite. It might be a spin, spin stabilized. Hmm. They said they're holding on to it until it's back in U.S. Air Force ground station range. There we go. That's thank you, Bradley Spies, and thank you, yeah, ground coverage. So the Air Force can track it. So they they want to do a release while they have the the Air Force ground tech tracking stations locked on. That's why. Thank you guys. You guys are awesome. All right. Well, thank you guys. Thank you for an amazing 2018. Um, and oh, they, th thank you for now. They said for, uh, ground support for satellite. Um, thank you guys for an awesome 2018. I couldn't do it without you guys. Literally. I mean, more than tripled the audience since last year, since January 1st of last year. That's literally thanks to you guys. That is you guys. I wouldn't have subscribers without you guys. You are my subscribers. You are the reason why I do what I do. So thank you so much for an amazing 2018. I can't wait for 2019. Big stuff, big stuff, big year in space flight. Let's do this. Let's be uh, those positive champions for all things space flight uh, and go out there and, and cheer on everyone doing that hard work. So thank you guys. Uh, while you're, I'm going to obviously leave you guys with, uh, with some everyday astronaut music. Don't forget you can take this stuff anywhere with you. The album Air, Maximum Aerodynamic Pressure is available on Spotify, iTunes, Google Play, Apple Music, wherever, whatever you do, you also have right here, uh, you do have a playlist on YouTube if you want to hear my music anytime you want. So you can find that album called Maximum Aerodynamic Pressure, available everywhere. Find it, download it, listen, and enjoy it over the new year. All right, thanks everybody. That's going to do it for me. I'm Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut, bringing space down to Earth for everyday people. Bye, everybody.